We will just give it a moment for people to come on in and join us and to join us on the live chat. But in the meantime, I'm very delighted to introduce myself and to welcome you to the Future of Democracy lecture series. My name is Beth Novak, and I'm director at the Governance Lab at NYU and a senior fellow at the Institute for Public Knowledge, who are co-hosts of this hopeful seminar that we occasionally run to focus uh, less on the problems of democracy and more on the things we can do to fix those problems. Uh, today we grapple though with probably one of the thorniest issues and one of the most problematical ones, which is the capacity, the functioning and the trust we have in Congress. Um, it's a very timely uh, um, day for this event, given that we are all listening to the impeachment trial. And it really brings to the fore what so many people have been concerned about, which is that for the past 15 years, public disapproval of the performance of Congress in the United States has averaged around 70%. And frankly, that's on a good day. Just to take one poll, Gallup puts that number, the number of people who trust the government, who trust Congress to do what's right a great deal of the time at only 6%. Uh, congressional Republicans in particular say that the impeachment trial that we that, that began today is actually getting in the way of doing the nation's business in a sort of we can't do walk and chew gum at the same time complaint that's attracting the attention and frankly the ire of the late night comedians. They seem to suggest that Congress cannot do more than one thing if do one thing at that. And frankly, what we're going to hear today is that they may not be wrong. We're gonna hear more from our distinguished guests about the downward spiral towards dismantling the analytical capacity of Congress, the cutting of staff, the freezing of pay, the ratcheting up of fundraising requirements, getting rid of the Office of Technology Assessment, and frankly, limiting Congress's ability as Congress watcher Daniel Schumann sums up uh, to engage in the reasoned decision-making placing Congress at the mercy of special interests. I'm a, somewhat of a fangirl of member of Congress, Bill Pascrell from my home state of New Jersey. And he writes, and here I'm quoting from him, think about this a second. Each of us represent approximately 750,000 Americans armed with small policy staffs, managing portfolios of hundreds of issues. This is the product of fiendish cuts set in 1995 that we have inexplicably never bothered to reverse. He goes on to say, our fonts of independent information have been cut off. Our investigatory muscles have atrophied, our committees stripped of their ability to develop policy, our small staffs are overwhelmed by the armies of lobbyists who roam Washington, and Congress is increasingly unable to comprehend a world growing more socially, economically, and technologically multifaceted. And he ends by saying, we did this to ourselves. So Kevin Kosar is here to tell us what Congress has done to itself and why, and above all, where I hope we're gonna spend most of our time and our discussion is what we can do to fix this mess that we've created. Kevin is resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, AEI, and editor of the new book, Congress Overwhelmed, the Decline in Congressional Capacity and the Prospects for Reform. I'm going to put uh, links to his wonderful new book in the chat as we go along into a number of his articles uh, so that you can get a copy for yourself. Uh, and before joining AEI, let me just say that Dr. Kosar was at the R Street Institute where he was Vice President of Policy. And before that, of course, for a long time, he was at the very venerable Congressional Research Service uh, where he focused on a wide range of public administration issues. So he knows what he's talking about when it comes to Congress, uh, having been in and around the place or a watcher of the place for a long time. He's the author of many books, but among my favorites, which I must call out to you, and if any of you are here, it's because I told you about this book last time. He is author of Whiskey, A Global History, published about 10 years ago. So I will put the links to all the other congressional uh, uh, and administrative law books in the side, but uh, with the global history, I'll send you the link to so you can go out and get it along with his other uh, links. So he's gonna um, give us a bit of a presentation for a little while. Um, and then we're gonna open it up to your questions. Please feel free to put those questions in the Q&A as we're going along. 
Uh, uh, you can also tweet those questions at the GovLab or at IPK, and we'll be looking out on social media for your questions. If any of you are hearing impaired, there is a live transcript running. Just click the live transcript button at the bottom for uh, closed captioning for the event. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kevin with a welcome. Thank you. Well, Beth, thank you so much. Uh, and thanks to your team for setting this all up. Uh, I'm, I'm flattered to be here. And uh, yeah, yeah you, your audience out here might be a little perplexed that somebody who worked at Congressional Research Service, works as a policy wonk, has nonetheless written a book uh, on whiskey and then another one on moonshine. Uh, my explanation is if you spend enough time thinking about Congress, you can't help but wanting to you know, turn to strong drink. <clears throat> well, I should first discuss the origins of the book and uh, you know, explain why. Uh, why do our already sagging bookshelves need another book and why in God's name does it need a book about Congress of all things? Who wants to read about that? Who cares? Um, my co-editors and I put this volume together, um, which took us a few years, because we thought this book was needed. Uh, this was not something where, oh, you know, one of us needed to get tenure or there was some other thing at work. It was a sense of shared concern uh, about the state of Congress and also about the way we think about Congress. Um, we hope the book will encourage Americans, including folks on Capitol Hill, to change their mindset a bit. We want them to think institutionally not just think about the institution, but to think in an institutional mode. So what do I mean by that? Well, we encourage folks when they think about Congress to think of it as a firm, an organization like any other organization. It has duties to perform and its members, its employees need to be channeled, incentivized and empowered to achieve the goals, to carry out the duties. You know, the internal structure and resourcing of any institution are key factors in its performance, and Congress is no exception to that rule. And, uh, you know, we're three political scientists. We've read plenty of books on Congress and American government. And as far as we could tell, there was no existing book that really applied that framework. Um, they came at it from a different angle. So we took this notion of institutional capacity, a general notion about organizations and applied it to Congress. And I think I can safely say that uh, my co-editors and I, we coined the term congressional capacity, which I'm delighted is now being used with some frequency. Um, our hope is that, you know, we realize that this is not gonna be a New York Times bestseller. Uh, it is a, dense book, it's an academic book. You have top political scientists from around the country who have written chapters for it. Um, lots of graphs, lots of math tucked in places, uh, but we really do hope the takeaways from this book will reach grass top audiences in particular, journalists, elected officials, members of the various public policy networks out there. And we also hope this book finds its way into the hands of undergrads and graduate students since these are the future leaders of society, some of whom will come to Capitol Hill, some of whom will end up teaching about Congress, some will end up interfacing it with in some way, shape, or form. The book was born out of a, uh, a survey, uh, a workshop that we held at New America, which is a, a left-leaning think tank in Washington, D.C. We did it back in 2018. You know, Lee Drutman and Tim LaPira, my co-editors, uh, and I had been kicking around this idea of like, we should we should do something about congressional capacity other than writing short pieces and op-eds and having conversations on the Hill. So we decided to bring a bunch of super smart people in and have them give white papers and to use this framework of congressional capacity to look at aspects of the institution and tell us what they saw. And we really weren't sure what they were going to see. Uh, this was experimental. Um, we also commissioned uh, a study survey of Capitol Hill staff that was led by Tim LaPira, which was a combination of a big poll of staff, of uh, many, 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 many pages of questions, and also a whole bunch of interviews of congressional staff. 
um, to put together a giant data set, both quantitative and qualitative, uh, that we could dive into and that all the authors of the book could look into um, and see if it had insights for what they were considering. Uh, and yeah, after three, three or so years of labor, we got this thing out, hallelujah. Um, let me share my screen right now because I have a few slides that I wanna share along the way. And let's see, how's that look? All clear? All right, yeah. So that's me and- um, uh, It's anybody? not in speaker view if you're trying to put it in speaker view. That's the only thing. Like that? Now we see it, perfect. Beautiful, all right, there you go. You see me, um, and if you find this stuff about Congress interesting, I'd love if you follow me uh, and you know, read more of what I'm putting out there and, and share it, because uh, I am an ev evangelist for this stuff. I am trying to get more people to think about it and to uh, in engage with it. So Congress, Overwhelmed, that's, that's the title. A um, little bit unfortunate insofar as just a few weeks ago, Congress itself was physically overwhelmed by a mob of insurrectionists, along with some curious onlookers who thought it would be cool to break into a building and take photos and brag about it on social media. Mercifully, that is not the topic of the book. Um, rather, um, this is a book about the institution of Congress and its failure to keep up with the escalating demands that grow every year on the institution. So let's talk about Congress and let's start at the very beginning, the Constitution. If you look at the Constitution, Articles 1 through 3 in particular, you'll see something that's really striking, um, which is Congress is declared to be the first branch of government. It was designed to be the most powerful of the three. I think a lot of folks like to think that, oh, well, the three branches are supposed to be equal. No, no, quite clearly, Congress was put in a dominating position. Um, it has all legislative powers. That is all powers to make laws that we're supposed to fall. Laws that allocate assets across society, that allow some behaviors and forbid other behaviors and so forth. In a decided break with the old world when the constitution was being created, um, you won't find in the constitution any authority for the executive to raise money on his or her own. Only Congress can raise money and it also takes an act of Congress to release that money from the treasury. You know, those of you who know your history will re recall a big story of the 15th through 17th centuries uh, in Europe was monarchs, raising money and then turning around and spending it to make war. American founders, they didn't want anything like that to happen. So they created a Congress that was close to the people, particularly the House of Representatives, and had control of the purse and all lawmaking authority. Uh, James Madison, when the, Congress, when, when the founders were doing their work, uh, actually worried that maybe Congress would be too powerful. And one of the things that they, you know, decided to do to protect against that from Congress becoming this monstrously powerful branch that swallowed all the other branches was to split it into two chambers. Uh, so it's a stagger the elections of the members of those chambers and also share some of the powers. You know, the president can veto bills, for example. All that sounds a million miles away from where we are today. I don't think I've met anyone who feels like we have this almighty Congress that's calling the shots and leading in governance. Anytime you turn on the media, um, you get a completely different picture and not entirely inaccurate. Um, just look at the recent coverage we've had of the new administration, the new presidential administration. The whole narrative is broadly about how is he going to solve big national problems? How can he act with dispatch to get things done? put the right people in charge of the right agencies? And how is he going to heal the nation's wounds? We also very frequently in this country these days tend to look to the courts as big policymakers, as the place that is going to kind of fix 
these fissures in society around various issues. Will the Supreme Court tackle this policy feud? Will it do campaign finance? What's John Roberts going to do next? Will he go with the minority? Will he go with the conservatives? Maybe we should think about expanding the number of justices on the court. That way, the court can do even more policy making and solve more of our problems. Uh, nowhere to be found in these sort of conversations, which are so popular and dominating today, is a place for Congress. Uh, Congress is, to a large degree, an afterthought, and again, not without reason. Uh, and certainly, somewhere, James Madison and the architects of the Constitution are shaking their heads in dismay. As Beth alluded to at the start, public is really down on Congress and down historically. I mean, to be clear, Congress has never been a popular institution. It's not like 90% of people have loved the place and suddenly their approval has gone in the ditch. It's always been low because Congress is this very open branch. It's very messy. People debate, they fight, they disagree. Sometimes they gridlock because they can't come to agreement. Uh, sometimes they behave in untoward ways. Like all that is on display and we see it. And it ain't pretty, uh, at least not in most of our eyes. But that said, public approval of Congress last 15 to 20 years is in a real bad place. It's, it's there. Um, barely getting above 25% with any regularity all the way down to 9% at points. Um, that is not good. And again, it's not a surprise. Uh, you know, typically when people look at Congress, what they see is, well, what former speaker Paul Ryan said, they see chaos. They don't see leadership, statesmanship, sound governance in Congress. They happen to go past C-SPAN, it's either guys bloviating to an empty chamber or yelling at each other in a hearing, and berating witnesses. It's not pretty. Meanwhile, every time you go to a news site, open up your newspaper, what do you see? Partisan bickering, gridlock, and tales of assorted foibles and malfeasance. That's the picture of Congress you get. You know, it's an interesting fact that today more Americans know about a hapless QAnon adherent in Congress who's barely been there a month. They know her name, but more than likely they don't know the name of the two chairs of the House and Senate Appropriations Committees, the committees that turn the tap on $4.5 trillion in spending each year. Extraordinarily powerful human beings unknown to the American public. By the way, they are Patrick Lee and Rosa DeLora. That's, you know, media selection is, a, is, a, is an, a thing, but to be clear, Congress has real problems. First branch has become paradoxically the least loved branch and it's a problem because, well, it's kind of tautological. We're a democratic republic. Uh, and by design, the legislature is supposed to be the heart of our governing system. It is by design the most democratic, lowercase d, of our governing institution. It's the place where the great diversity of the country can meet and debate issues small and large and vote to decide them. When Congress fails, basically it is failing us. It's failing to work through the strains and challenges of diversity, of pluralism. And this failure which has been ongoing for some time, also leads to the unhappy effect of power flowing to the other branches. Um, the president gets more and more powerful and feels more and more pressure to just do stuff by a pen and phone, as Barack Obama put it. Supreme Court also feels incentivized to stick, take up issues when Congress does not solve them. And in each case, whether it's the president doing it through executive order or the judiciary hearing a case and make, having a decision, there's always that tinge of legitimacy. All legislative powers are supposed to be with Congress, yet they're deciding 
significant things because Congress is failing to decide them. It's a problem. So what's wrong with Congress? It's tempting and not entirely inaccurate to blame individuals and parties. It's Mitch McConnell's fault. It's Nancy Pelosi's fault. She wrecked the place. No, 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 no. We need to throw out the Democrats. No, no, no. It's the Republicans. They're the ones who have gone all freakazoid on us. We got to get rid of them. Get rid of the, the wrong people. Get rid of the wrong party. That will fix it. To be sure, Congress's performance is affected by people. Some legislators are just better than others. You know, there's an old dichotomy in uh, political science about workhorses and show horses. The workhorses are the members of Congress who will beaver away, study issues, become expert in them, engage in fact-based oversight, and work across the aisle to try to get things done. Then there are the show horses. I sometimes call them the rodeo clowns. They're the ones who seem to wake up each morning and ask themselves, how do I get on TV? How do I light up social media? How do I attract attention to myself? They're not much interested in governing. And quite frankly, we do have too many of those folks, but they've always been with us. You know, hundred years ago, there were bombastic asses in Congress. So we keep changing parties and we keep changing people and performance doesn't get better. Now that may be hard to believe, but it's true. Since the 1990s, the membership of Congress has churned a lot. Hardly anyone who was there 20 years ago to say nothing of 30 years is still in Congress. And party control of the chambers, well, uh, control has pinballed back and forth between Democrats and Republicans of each chamber more rapidly since the 1990s than at any time since the late 19th century. So again, people are moving out, parties are losing control, and yet Congress still disappoints. So what's the problem? Well, what we argue in the book is a great part of the problem is the institution. The institution is not up to the job. Let me move to another slide here. Boop, not that one, a little bit early for that. Um, the Constitution puts immense demands on Congress. It's got a lot of responsibilities. Here, let me find, see if I can find it for you. Ding. Nope, backwards. There it is. It's got to do all this stuff. And that's just in the Constitution, 200-year-old document. Then there's reality, the reality that has evolved around it. What we as Americans expect of the federal government has changed fantastically compared to just 50 years ago, to say nothing of 100 years ago. Here's, here's an example. In the late 1920s, there was a catastrophic flood of the Mississippi River. What did the federal government do about it? What did Congress do about it? Congress did nothing. The president issued a public statement and he encouraged Americans to you know, give money to the Red Cross. And the Red Cross would go help the people displaced by flooding, whose homes had been washed out, whose fields had been wrecked, et cetera, et cetera. It wasn't the federal government's job. That is unthinkable today. Indeed, you know, President uh, Bush II got in great trouble when New Orleans was clobbered by a terrible hurricane. And he did not act with sufficient dispatch. And he sent somebody down there who didn't show sufficient competence. The expectations of Americans about government service are so much higher. We want more and we want it to be better. But we've not set ourselves up very well to have a Congress that can deliver. Let me just tick back for a second before I get to that slide. Right now, just to give you a scope of what Congress faces, its responsibilities. Let me give you some data points. First, Congress has to fund and oversee 
180 federal agencies who employ 4 million civilian and military persons. These agencies administer, administer thousands upon thousands of policies and programs that have direct effect on the public one way or another. In 2019, federal spending was 4.4 trillion. Last year, it was 6.6 .6 trillion, which is seven times higher than it was in 1980. 40 years, seven times higher, seven times more dollars going out the door that are supposed to achieve something for the public. The amount of money spent last year, just to give you a sense of scale, was 12 times the revenues of the largest corporation on earth, which is Walmart. Government is a massive operation. It's a big deal. And that doesn't even count state and local government. The Senate, we have a brand new presidential administration. Setting aside the time that has to be spent on impeachment, they have over 300 executive branch nominees, cabinet nominees to work through. They have thousands of nominees to independent agencies that they've got to say, yeah, you're good enough to do the job or no, we're going to vote you down. It's an immense job. And of course, we Americans, um, we want more. And there are more of us. The number of people in America since 1980 has increased 45%. That's a lot more voters. That's a lot more constituents for 535 members of Congress. My old agency, the Congressional Research Service, some years ago, took a look at the number of letters, emails, phone calls that congressional offices were receiving. And it was somewhere between 25 and 30 million per year. Divided by members, that's about 46,000 communications coming in per legislator. And every one of the folks sending those expect a response. And this is to say nothing of the vast proliferation of interest groups media, lobbyists, all of whom are beating a door to Congress and asking for something. Give me your time, give me some help. So the workload has been escalating for Congress year after year after year after year. But insanely, Congress has little invested in its capacity. Let's bounce forward to this slide. It's a very damning one. Congress as an institution has not reformed itself in a serious, significant way since the early 1970s. And if you look at this slide, it tells a damning story of Congress. The number of staffers in the House of Representatives, the People's House, who work for members and more importantly, work for congressional committees, which are supposed to engage in policymaking and oversight, it's fewer today. They have fewer staff and a bigger job to do. It's also the case that Congress has fewer nerds, legislative branch support agencies, Congressional Research Service, Government Accountability Office, Congressional Budget Office, the staff count's gone down. These are nonpartisan civil servants, people with expertise, and they often hold their jobs for a very long time. So they are a source of memory about how things work in DC and don't work. We don't, we don't have as many anymore. In fact, as Beth alluded to, there was once another legislative branch support agency called the Office of Technology Assessment. It was around from the early 70s. It was created in the early 70s when Congress decided to stand up for itself. It felt it was falling behind in various issue areas, budgeting, policy generally, and technology. So it created the Congressional Budget Office 
It expanded the work of CRS so it could have more policy experts in house and it created the Office of Technology Assessment. And then in 1994, Congress simply zeroed out the Office of Technology Assessment and the 120 civil servants in there who had been helping Congress were kicked to the curb. Really hard to see how it is that when you have escalating demands upon an institution, diminishing capacity, hard to see how this is going to work well. Now, while I'm here uh, <coughs> mentioning technology, I, I, I have to give two illustration of the sorry state, state of things in Congress. Its tech platform is not good. Um, two examples. Beepers. Yeah, you heard me. Uh, this is not a Seinfeld episode. Beepers. Two years ago, William Timmons, member of the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress, arrived in Washington, D.C. He was ready to do stuff here, to govern. And very early on, a staffer handed him a digital pager. He was mystified. What, what, why am I being given one of these as part of my job? And the answer was, well, we don't have an app for telling you when Congress is supposed to vote. We still use these pagers. So keep this in your pocket at all times. And when it goes, v -v -v, you know, then you know, run to the chamber because you got about 10 minutes before the vote's going to start calling. Beepers, yeah. Second thing, this is particularly frustrating to newer and younger members of Congress. They get down here and they find that when they're reading or trying to write bills, they can't track changes. They have dead PDFs. The documents, all the various references that are put in there, the US code and the statutes and regulations, there are no hyperlinks. There are no digital annotations to help these individuals understand what exactly is in the bill. You know, there was a bill last year, very short bill, had one line to it. It a proposed, quote, deleting subsection D of section 8909A of title five of the US code. That's all the bill said. What does that mean? Well, what it actually meant was that if that bill had been enacted, tens of billions of dollars in postal worker retirement benefits would have been affected. No biggie, right? This is no way to govern. Beepers, dead PDFs, PDFs that don't tell you anything about what they're trying to change in the law. So yes, the story that we tell in this book is a, is a sad one. It's more work to do for Congress and less capacity, which makes for poor governance, and which might explain a bit about why the American public is so down on Congress. Now, the obvious question is, is why didn't Congress do something about it? In the past, it has reformed itself. In the early 1940s, it massively reformed itself when it felt the executive branch was much more powerful than it. In the early 70s, Congress you know, had seen both Republicans, Nixon, and Democrats, LBJ, uh, be way, behave in ways that they found autocratic, power greedy. Congress reasserted itself in the early 70s. But the last 50 years, not so much. I mean, under the Constitution, Congress can organize itself just about any way it pleases, structure itself, create its own processes, its own rules. And it can fund itself as much as it wants to. But it just hasn't really leaned into this situation, in part because, well, there's no committee in Congress, at least not until recently, that has the job to do that. It's kind of a collective action problem. Everybody can complain about Congress being anachronistic and dysfunctional, but there's nobody actually in charge of getting it upgraded. It's also the case that there are people who are at the top of the House and the top of the Senate, very powerful people, who are happy with the way the place runs right now. They know where all the levers of power are. They know how the game works. They don't like rules and structures being changed because that can create unforeseen circumstances or weaken their power. 
And it's also the case, unfortunately, that legislators, not without reason, fear that the American public will punish them, vote them out of office if they dare to spend more money on the institution. Um, we have some polling data in the book, which indicate that you know, there are Americans who think that Congress is actually overstaffed, which is so at odds with the reality. Um, and we also have some political dysfunctions which discourage taking care of the institution. There's a penny wise pound foolishness among some members. Um, I cringe each year when any number of members of Congress, you know, sometime in the spring typically, will release a press release bragging that they did not spend all the money that they were given for their offices and their staffs. Uh, and instead, they're gonna take some of that money and just give it back to the US Treasury because they're fiscally responsible. Um, that's a nice post to strike, but what that means on a practically speaking is that their staff who are already underpaid um, will continue to be underpaid, which of course contributes to high staff turnover on Capitol Hill. The average congressional staffer on Capitol Hill is in her, his or her mid twenties has been there for about three years. Um, and when staff churn and, you know, they come and they're gone after a few years. What's that mean? Well, it means you need to bring on new people and hire them afresh. And I don't think that there is any organization that would imagine that the best human resources strategy is to bring people in, burn them out fast, and have them exit out the door. But that's what happens. So like any restaurant, factory, or company, Congress can only achieve as much as its organizational capacity permits. That's the argument of the book. And by implication, if we're gonna fix Congress, we got to upgrade its people power, its internal structures, its processes for doing work, and its technologies. Now, good news is that there has been some change. Congress has begun the process of reforming itself. In response to myself and a whole crazy quilt of folks here in DC representing various organizations who are all dismayed by the state of Congress, we've managed to goad them into increasing spending on our first branch of government by a little bit. Got a long way to go, but it's a start. They are spending a little more on the institution and they're taking some baby steps towards putting in place real reforms. I should say, um, about 60 years ago, just this little backstory, um, Lee Drutman of, of New America, uh, and my, one of my co-editors and I, put together something called the Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group. And the idea was that this was supposed to be a vehicle for getting the ball rolling to reform Congress. Um, we realized that despite all the misery on Capitol Hill and everybody being so down on the institution in America, nobody was actually spending time talking about what was wrong or how to fix it. So we created a website and we created monthly meetings of congressional staff and, and various nerds. And we just talked about aspects of what was working and not working in the place. And suddenly a conversation developed and media picked up on it. More people started coming to our meetings. And next thing you know, we were in the position um, a few years ago that the discontent, which had been widespread, was now being active, active, acted upon. Um, and we saw the creation of this select committee on the modernization of Congress. It's a special committee inside the House. And it, you know, for two more than two years now has been beavering away, studying the problems, uh, reaching out to various stakeholders and in, inside the chambers and asking them about, you know, what's working, what's not working, what can we do, what should we do? And this committee, to its great credit, has operated in an entirely bipartisan way. The membership is divided 50-50 Democrats to Republicans. And um, they do not issue official recommendations for reforms unless 
everyone on the committee agrees. And to date, they've put out 97 reforms, uh, recommendations, and about 30 of those were actually passed by the House as a resolution to change the way uh, things work. So there's some good news. Shoots of green are, 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 are appearing. But of course, overcoming the damage of 50 years of neglect of Congress as an institution is going to take a long time. And upgrading the institu institution as complicated as Congress, um, it's grubby work and very few legislators have the stomach for it. Um, you know, a lot of members of Congress, they choose issues that either resonate heavily back home. You know, you work in a district that used to have lots of industrial jobs. Well, of course, you're gonna be trying to get on committees that work on something that deals with that topic. Um, there are not a whole lot of Americans who are clamoring in the streets and wanting their representatives to fix Congress. Um, you just don't see that sort of pluralism out there. Uh, and members of Congress also like to join committees and do work that enables them to fundraise. It's great to be a member of the Senate Banking Committee, I'll tell you, uh, because guess what? The banks come knocking and they're happy to help you uh, with your reelection fundraising. Fixing Congress, eh, there's not a whole lot of fundraising that can be done uh, around that. Perhaps there's none. Uh, so very few people wanna do this job. And of course, as I alluded to earlier, fixing Congress always runs the risk of goring the oxes of the most powerful members of Congress. And I can't understate to you just how powerful the leaders uh, in, in the House and the Senate are today. They can, to a degree, make or break somebody's career as a legislator. And so, you know, typically your average member of Congress is very hesitant to do things that threaten leadership. But if we're ever gonna get there, if we're ever going to fully reform Congress, uh, it's essential. Rules need to be changed. Internal structures that have been fixed for decades and that no longer make sense, they need to be replaced. You know, in my ideal world, we would just take a blank sheet and start over. Ask ourselves, what's worth keeping? What's not worth keeping? What makes sense? Because the structure that's cropped up in the last 50 years uh, is just so convoluted, so confused, and it really doesn't channel the energies of the people who work there towards positive ends. And you know, this is what I'll close on, which is um, if congressional reform is to go forward, people in Congress need a lot of help from you all. Whether it's retweeting the work of the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress, whether it's writing to your own members and banging on them about the sorry state of things and telling them that this is important and that you will even consider voting on it. These sorts of things to make, will help make it real for legislators and perhaps encourage more of them to step up to the plate and do something about it. Because, uh, you know, I wrote a book, uh, <laughs> but there's only so much I can do on my own. Uh, so with that, uh, you know, let me close and say thank you for listening and I look forward to fielding your questions. Fantastic. Uh, you have lots of questions already in the Q&A, so I will have to forego my long <laughs> list of questions in favor of the many that are waiting. But I will just start with um, one or two quick, well, I'll, I'll ask you for quick answers, um, although they are not simple questions, which is just really about the desire to change. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, and what you really see as being the role of the legislature. So, so much of what you're talking about with regard to eroded capacity um, is what I would describe as kind of the ability to solve problems, the ability of the mm -hmm. legislator to solve problems. But I wonder how much interest there really is in solving problems, given these trends, given what you've said about leadership. Um, is that really how people conceive of their role? Uh, and, um, and is there anything we can do about that? Is the, is the role of the legislator to solve problems or is it really something else? 
So let me start with that and and yeah. um, and and as for a quick a quick thought on that. How you yeah think people yeah can see I mean role. the only you know, most fundamental reason to have a popular assembly um, is that it's a place where these various disputes in society can be raised and they can be ranked based on you know importance. And then you figure out ways to work through them. Uh, you know, that way, you know, people are fighting on the floor of the house with words rather than people clobbering each other in the streets with clubs. You know, so the basic analogy has been around since Aristotle. And uh, yeah, the problem solving. Um, we've got stuff in the book about, you know, committees and, and how over time, like their capacity and inclination to problem solve has decreased, which is a big problem because committees are supposed to be the places where people as legislators specialize, become experts and come up with solutions. And yeah, I think you're spot on. One of the terrible things that has happened is that the socialization of new members of Congress has broken down. You know, anybody who's come to Congress in the last 10 years upon arriving very quickly, they're socialized that you should be a partisan warrior, you should support leadership, and you should raise money and just vote the party line. And if you can get on TV and raise a lot of hell, even better. And that doesn't readily lend itself to problem solving. It actually runs in the, the opposite direction. Um, and I think, you know, the hope of performing Congress now has to rest heavily on the newest members, the people who have not been a kind of co-opted by the mindset that the whole point of Congress is Fight Club. So I want to start to bring in some additional questions here um, from the chat, and there are they are, and please keep them coming, and I'll do my best to field them. And Kevin, you'll do your best to answer them in brief. Um, so Christopher Taylor and Lee Rainey asked somewhat, I'm going to relate these questions, whether they intended them that way or not. So Chris is asking the question about how you're measuring the whole concept of capacity and the notion that more staff actually means more capacity. In this day and age of innovation, uh, we see nimble institutions uh, doing more with less. Uh, and so why is this, the, so he, he's asking, I think in some sense, why is this the measure of capacity? But then Lee is asking a question about sort of the opportunities here for tech, digital tech and for innovation to improve this doleful situation. So I think it's a twin uh, kind of question about whether this measure of capacity is the right one or whether it's outdated um, and whether there aren't new things we can do to improve and increase capacity that go beyond hiring more staff. Oh, great questions both. And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh... If anyone has any ideas about how to better measure various facets of capacity, I want to hear them um, because it's a hard thing to do. Uh, you know, I, I can tell you when I started at CRS in 2003, we still had people on staff, just a couple whose job was typist. And they held their jobs, uh, you know, because in part we still had some very um, seasoned research analysts who use typewriters. So yeah, we no longer need to hire typists. So those are less fewer positions that we need. I grant that. But when you look at the severity of the drop in the number of staff, and then you get into the data and look at what staff are actually assigned to do, that's very telling because the trend lines are that there are fewer staff and a higher percentage of those staff are not here in DC, but they're out in the districts, back in the home state offices. And their jobs primarily there are constituent service. The person who's fighting with the VA about a check or something like that. They're not working on policy. They're not working on oversight broadly. And also another trend in the employment stats on the Hill is a higher percentage of members personal staff are um, devoting themselves to communications work. You know, since the total number of staff are not going up, if you have more people doing constituent service, more people doing communications work, you have fewer people doing policy stuff. And there are not that many people on member staffs to begin with. So that is kind of 
inarguable. Um, but yeah, getting at the other metrics, um, like how do you measure the um, quality or productivity of the system for moving legislation in 1990 versus the system for moving it in 2020? Now, I mean, at least we do have PDFs these days. We don't have, you know, gophers running paper copies of bills around to each office. Uh, uh, and we don't have to run a Xerox center or mimeograph center down in the bowels of the Capitol. So yeah, you know, we've got some better technology here, but I'm not sure how to measure the difference. And I guess this is where I loop back to the interviews that we did uh, with congressional staff. Um, and my own experience in working with staff for so long is that to a person, they complain about life being like drinking from a fire hose. They complain about the technology being crappy. They complain about the red tape, the bureaucratic stuff on the Hill. They complain that they're being pulled in 50 different directions and they're not sure that they're doing any of the tasks that are being dumped on them in a good way. Like that's a lot of qualitative evidence and then when you look at the congressional outputs, I mean, the laws being made and the big problems being solved. I mean, immigration, come on guys, the solution's there. You can work this out, but they're not. Um, I'm sorry, what was the second question? The second question was really about um, innovations that we might try. So Lee is asking yeah. about the role of technology and innovation, whether it's crowdsourcing and other things. And this is, he's uh, speaking music to yeah. my ears here, um, uh, but is really asking the question about, are there ways to increase capacity, to increase problem solving ability to do things differently than we've done them before? Um, and, and what's your thought there? Oh God, yes. Uh, I think technology is actually a sweet spot for reform. Uh, number one, it doesn't tend to politically divide people. You know, it's not like they're democratic talking points about switching to some software and Republicans are gonna oppose it. You know, it's, people just tend to think of that as in the background and they don't, they're not gonna fight about it. Um, and I think there's huge change that can come through improving technology. Um, in part, it's due to the fact that Congress is by its very nature amateur. Anybody can be a member of Congress. You don't have to be good at that stuff. You're not gonna go to school and be trained to be an excellent legislator. You're also not gonna be trained in school to be an excellent staff member. Everybody is learning on the fly there. The ignorance is massive. And the, the big challenge they face is just figuring it out and you'd be shocked at the quantity of paper files there. You'd be shocked at the absence of knowledge management. You know, all these paper and all these data is being generated, but it's not being managed and mined so that people can figure things out quickly as opposed to reinventing the wheel. It's incredible how much time gets wasted and it's because of bad information management down there. Uh, so yeah, Kevin, I think the possibilities are many. Kevin, do you attribute, for example, the failure when COVID hit for the United States Congress to be able to do what Chile did, what Brazil did, what the Ukraine did, what so many other countries uh, have done, namely to go online, to deliberate online, to vote online, to make laws online, um, whereas we you know, could do none of the above. We've managed in the interim to figure out how to have committee hearings on Zoom and, and Teams and other things. Um, but with the exception of some limited new reforms on proxy voting, uh, mm. we have been through a year of a pandemic with uh, you know, a, a great deal of difficulty. I, I have to tell you, I participated in, uh, and some people here may have seen or participated in, there were mock hearings to get people to learn how to use Zoom and to see if we could do some very basic stuff. Um, do you see this as being this, again, kind of lack of knowledge management infrastructure, or is this about political power grabbing uh, by leadership or by one party or the other? Do you see this lack of desire to innovate um, stemming from uh, um, party politics or stemming from somewhere else or coming just from a, a, a just a, a backward facingness? Yeah, I think there are 
certainly a few factors at play. I mean, I know there were some legislators who were quite serious when they were looking at the Constitution and saying, oh, no, we can't really do stuff unless we're, we're physically present in some way. And then there was debates about, well, wait a minute, you've done proxy before. A lot of the members who you know, hadn't been here back when we did proxy and other sorts of stuff. So there were constitutional stuff that people got anchored on and bogged down on and didn't know how to deal with. I think also it's the case that there are a lot of people on Capitol Hill who are uh, just not technologically adroit. Um, you know, there are still guys carrying around flip phones and they rely extremely heavily on their staff just to do a Zoom. Um, they're not, you know, it's not a job qualification to be good at that. So I feel like there's an element of a generational gap that has also played into this. Uh, and we certainly have seen our share of congressional Zoom um, bad moments. Uh, um, and then there was just partisanship. Uh, you know, the Democrats very quickly to their credit, particularly in the House said, we need to move to proxy, we need to move to electronic communication, we need to do stuff. And there were Republicans who just reflexively said no as if they thought that somehow this was gonna put one over on them. And uh, that, that was just foolishness. Um, and I, I think we all paid a price, a price for that. But yeah, no. So it, let's bring in. It's not good. <laughs> Sorry, so we have, um, let me just let everybody know that what we're going to do is take a, two or three more questions. We will then end the live stream and do our, for those who've been with us before, we will then promote everybody to panelists so you can ask remaining questions for yourselves. Um, and we'll be able to have what I refer to as virtual wine and cheese and have a little bit more interactive conversation without the black box of the, uh, of the webinar format. So Lee asks you the small, Leah, sorry, asks you the small question, Leah Diaz, uh, she, really, she asks you, do you think the system of checks and balances and separation of powers is strong enough in the US or does it need reform? Um, and this really gets back to the issue of um, what many people have complained of with regard to uh, Congress instead of, I think, fixing itself that they are punting responsibility uh, back to the executive branch, that they're really doing everything they can to kick the can down the road. And again, it, it, it reinvokes the question of what is the role of the legislature today? What is the role of Congress? Um, and so, do you, so she puts it in terms though of the strength of checks and balances in this country. Do you think Congress mm -hmm. is doing its job of, over, of oversight? Uh, sometimes, but uh, too often not. Um, no, I mean, the logic of our system, constitutional system, is that you know the interests of the individual are, is going to be connected to the constitutional rights of the place. And the idea was that you know you don't expect men to be angels, as Madison put it, but rather that their interests would lead them to doing things that kind of produce good government. And one of those is like, don't let other branches just take your power. Protect the institution's prerogatives. And uh, that linkage has just somehow severed. It might be, there might be factors that explain it that are external, but I think to some degree, it's just the mindset. I mean, again, when you have new legislators who show up in town and what they basically are taught is we gotta stick it to the other guys and we gotta take back control of the chamber in the next two years, and that's your job. You know, who cares if you're delegating powers away? Who cares if you're actually getting anything done? If you could just hammer the other side and make it look as bad as possible, maybe you win. Um, and, but yeah, no, the story of the 20th century is a great story of legislative power just flowing away from it and occasional efforts to claw it back, but most of it stays away. In part, the workload. You know, <laughs> like it's easier to delegate stuff because otherwise you have to do it yourself. Well, they exercised some power today and decided it was constitutional for them to try an ex-president. Uh, we'll see if that's the start of something. I want to end, I'll just go uh, two minutes over here to ask David's question, David Fairman's question, which is of the recommendations that the Select Committee on Modernization has made, what two or three are the most important 
to be enacted? Uh, do you think they can be enacted in this Congress? And what two or three have they not made yet that you hope they'll make in their next go around in the second iteration? Oh, wow. Tough question, tough question. Um, I guess the stuff that I'm most excited about in the uh, select committee's work, uh, clusters heavily on the kind of human resources issue. Um, you know, people might imagine it's a glorious thing to come work for Congress, but it's pretty rough. Um, the pay is crummy. The price of housing is, is obscene in Washington, D.C. Uh, the hours are dreadful and the work is often disappointing. And this is why people burn out and, you know, go elsewhere. Um, and, you know, people show up and they just don't have any, they're not trained for their jobs. They're just thrown in. Um, into a very difficult position. And the select committee has made various recommendations to get a standing staff academy stood up, uh, to have some sort of basic onboarding for people, um, to also do things to increase diversity within the chamber, because uh, that has been a huge issue. Um, the average congressional staffer is a white male. Uh, and that's just not the way the country is anymore. Um, and interestingly enough, there's a linkage. People who work as staffers are have a much higher probability of actually ending up working as members of Congress one day. So I'm excited about those things. I'm excited also that the select committee has put out this proposal for re-empowering legislators to direct spending to their home districts. You know, one of the worst, you know, earmarks has a dirty, is a dirty word and it, they were banned supposedly some years ago. Um, but the practical effect of disabling the average legislator from saying, hey, let's put some transportation dollars in to fix this crumbling bridge in my home district. Taking that away from them has just, and giving it to the executive branch has it's just left them with little power to make change for the people back home. Um, so I'm excited about that one. Uh, you know, I would love the, if, actually, I, I'm not, the select committee can only do so much because it's a house only thing and it has a very limited jurisdiction for its activities. My dream is that we ultimately get our way up to a joint committee of Congress, Senate, House, with a wide open jurisdiction to make big change. But that's a long with time. With that, coming. I wanna, uh, so there are quite a few good questions that uh, we did not have time to get to. So I would encourage you to stick around uh, after the live stream ends and uh, which will be in just a moment. But while I still have uh, the intertube watching us, I wanna say thank you so much to Kevin for joining us today and sharing with us this wonderful new book. Um, I wanna also commend to people uh, upcoming events from the Institute for Public Knowledge, which you can find at ipk.nyu.edu. And one of those is our next Future of Democracy lecture series, which I'm putting the link to in the chat. That will be with Media Lab, MIT Media Lab Professor Deb Roy, um, uh, former chief media scientist of Twitter, talking about some of the exciting work that he's doing on uses of machine learning to listen to citizens. I think some really hopeful and exciting technology that Congress could be using because it really thinks um, helps us to think about how we can engage with citizens at scale for the first time. Um, so with that, let me say thank you so, so very much to um, Kevin, and we will put the link back in the chat. And but for those of you who are watching online, please rush out to buy the new book. Uh, um, here comes the chat. Congress overwhelmed the decline in congressional capacity and prospects for reform. And for those who want to stick around to ask their questions live, uh, day, uh, sorry, Kevin has told me that he will be happy to stick around for a few minutes. So thank you to everybody online. We'll end the live stream and hang on for a moment while we zap you back in the room with us.